Hi, I'm Rahil Philippos and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about the need for a homegrown vaccine to fight cervical cancer in India. We also talk about a new discovery related to the case of the late father Stan Swamy. But first, we talk about a breakthrough in fusion energy. On Tuesday, the United States Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm announced a major scientific breakthrough in harnessing fusion, which is the energy that powers the sun and the stars. Last week, at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition. And that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. It's the first time it has ever been done in a laboratory. Researchers at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory achieved the scientific breakthrough which will help in national defense and also help to achieve clean power. The Indian Express's Amitabh Sinha joins us in the segment to talk about the scientific experiment and to explain to us what is fusion energy. So Amitabh, can you first talk about the breakthrough that was announced by the US Secretary of Energy? Right, it's a relatively simple thing to state. Basically, the one research group in the United States has been able to carry out a nuclear fusion reaction in which for the first time they have been able to get a net energy gain as in more energy was released in the fusion reaction than was consumed to make that reaction possible so there was a net energy gain and this has happened for the first time okay and can you explain to us the concept of fusion energy right so fusion and fission are nuclear reactions so you know we know about all elements being composed of atoms and the fact that all atoms have a nucleus in their center and those nucleus contains electrons and protons and we've also realized about 50 60 70 80 years ago that there was immense amount of energy trapped in the nucleus and if that energy could be harnessed it could be used for a variety of purposes now we know the atom itself is very very tiny in fact we can't even see that it's extremely tiny nucleus is even tinier and so the energy in one particular atom would be relatively low of course but here we are talking about billions and trillions of atoms together and together that energy is a huge amount and we have been using this nuclear energy for a very long time and then all the nuclear reactors that we see across the world which produce electricity they somehow able to harness the energy that's there in the nucleus of the atom a similar process is used to trigger the nuclear bombs also which were dropped in hiroshima and nagasaki for example and a lot of these nuclear weapons that are there in the arsenal of uh, several countries they work on a similar kind of principle no harnessing the energy in this case for weapons now the nuclear energy that we use today is basically based on the fission reactions right and amitabh what does fission reaction actually mean Right so fission as this name suggests is about splitting the atom you know what happens is the nucleus of an atom of a larger or a heavier element is split into two nuclei of relatively lighter elements and in that process a lot of energy is released and that energy is harnessed for our electricity generation or for whatever purposes we need that fusion is the opposite of that so fusion involves the fusing together of two lighter nuclei or nuclei of two lighter elements into nucleus of a heavier element right again in that process a huge amount of energy is released in fact fusion releases much more energy many many times over the fission reactions and you know fusion is also you know it's the same process that actually powers the sun and every other stars you know the reason that they shine is because at the core you know the energy of the sun is actually coming from fusion reactions wherein hydrogen atoms are getting fused to form helium atoms so that is how even nature is producing energy 
So we have been trying to do this fusion. We have mastered the fission reactions and we know how to produce you know, energy from fission and lots of countries, including India, we have so many nuclear power plants. But fusion is several times more complicated. It gives you much more energy. Also, it's a cleaner source of energy. So in terms of your future energy requirements, your climate change concerns, those are all taken care of if fusion becomes a reality because, you know, you get large amounts of energy, a relatively clean energy. It's cleaner even than fission reactions and even the radioactivity risk, uh, which is one of the concerns with the use of nuclear energy that we have right now. So even that risk is relatively smaller in fusion compared to fission. So by all yardsticks, it's something that is to be aspired for. And we've been trying to harness fusion energy for a very long time. In fact, we started almost at the very same time when we started our work on fission reactions. Fusion started almost simultaneously. But while fission reactors are fairly widespread and we know how to do it and we have mastered the technology, fusion is still a challenge. We have not been able to do it. And even by the best estimates as of now, it will take at least a few decades from now to become a reality. Okay. And can you expand on these challenges that you just mentioned? So the, what is the difficulty? So the basic problem is that fusion gets enabled at very high temperatures something similar to what is there in the core of the sun or the other stars. So the temperatures that we are talking about are in millions of you know degrees of centigrade. I think hundreds of millions of degrees of centigrade. Now, recreating that kind of temperature in a reactor or in a laboratory, that has been the most difficult challenge. Till now, we have not been able to do those kind of things. So now that's the biggest challenge. Now, we are experimenting with it. We hope that we'll be able to do it. We have done experimental sort of fusion reactions several times now in different places. And for a few seconds, we have been able to recreate that kind of temperature, millions of degrees of centigrade. Now, the whole challenge, as I said, is about creating that right temperature for enabling fusion reactions. And how do you create those high temperatures? So those are the two different ways that have been tried. So one of the things that the US scientists have been trying, and this method has been tried by a, a few other research groups as well in China, Europe, also some people are trying that. They basically use very high energy laser beams to create that kind of temperatures in a small space. The other one, which is more widely used, is uses a very strong magnetic fields, again, to achieve those kind of temperatures. Now, that uh, magnetic fusion is supposed to be the more mainstream way of doing fusion reactions. And there is a huge international collaboration working on this particular project. It's been working for a very long time now. And uh, that particular project, it's called ITER. Okay. And can you tell us about the progress of the project? So that ITER project, which is based in Europe, in France. So... That is an international collaboration of seven founding countries, including India, one, seven member countries. And these countries are together collaborating to produce the first fusion reactor. It's still in the building phase. Once it gets built, it would be probably the most complicated, biggest machine to have been built, leaving behind things like uh, the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, France border. Or, uh, you know, the machine that detected gravitational waves a couple of years ago. So this would be the most complex machine that we are building right now. But we are still some distance away from being able to do a fusion reaction in a proper reactor. And current timelines suggest you know, we should be able to do it between around 2035, 2038. That's the time period. But that's just about producing energy in a reactor. What we are doing right now is doing it in the laboratories for a very small time, but doing it in a reactor for a substantially longer period, that's likely to happen around 2035, 2040. And then further, it would need to be developed to see that energy that you get would have to be linked to uh, you know, turbine machines and electricity produced. So that will take some further time. So we are looking at the time horizon of 2045, 2050 in the most optimistic scenarios to be able to get energy from fusion reactions. But 
still it's something that scientists are banking very heavily on for a variety of reasons that it will take care of our energy needs for the next 100 200 years will be free of these fossil fuel problems also it's a very clean energy it gives you large amounts of energy so it frees us from a lot of constraints that we have right now so it's certainly the energy of future but we have to master it and there are huge huge challenges right now we are nowhere closer to getting this energy in the near term right well amitab scientists have been experimenting on this since the 1950s so why has this net gain of energy not been achieved yet so the fusion reactions can happen only in very very high temperature conditions it requires millions of degrees of centigrade to exist and to create those temperatures huge amounts of energy is required so when that reaction happens yes it does release a large amount of energy but so far the released energy has not been able to compensate for the kind of energy that is consumed while making that reaction possible so that has been one problem as of now there have been instances in the past wherein a near break even kind of situation had been achieved wherein the output energy was almost equal to what was being consumed to facilitate the reaction but this is the first time that uh, you know the us researchers have said that the final output has been significantly higher than what was consumed eventually when the reaction becomes sustainable so as of now when the experimental reactions are taking place these reactions continue for a very short period of time or just about a few seconds because sustaining that kind of a very high temperature as of now is a difficult proposition so eventually when these reactions these fusion reactions become sustainable for a you know relatively longer period of time for about 5 minutes or 10 minutes you know once that kind of stability in terms of reaction is reached then it is estimated that the output energy the energy that is released through the reaction would be about at least 5 to 10 times more than the energy that is consumed to facilitate the reaction so that is what we are looking at these are incremental progresses that are being made in the fusion reaction process and there is still some distance to go wherein we are in a position to extract something meaningful out of this Next we talk about a homegrown vaccine to prevent cervical cancer in India. The indigenously developed HPV or human papilloma virus vaccine to prevent cervical cancer is scheduled to become available by April May next year in the country. And a nationwide immunization drive for girls in the age group of 9 to 14 years is likely to begin by mid 2023. The vaccine called Cervavac has been developed by Serum Institute of India and is a cheaper alternative to the vaccines already available in the market. In this segment, my colleague Ucha Sadman speaks to the Indian Express's Anona Dath about the need for a homegrown vaccine and the need for an immunization drive in India where almost 75,000 women die each year because of cervical cancer. So Anona can you tell us why there is a need for a homegrown HPV vaccine So first of all uh, when we say cervical cancer vaccine now cervical cancer is actually like most of it not all of it but uh, almost all of the cervical cancer cases happen in people who have had a prolonged infection with HPV virus human papilloma virus HPV is one of the most common cancers in women it's the second largest killer among uh, women's cancer first being breast cancer so it's a huge problem in india so we have uh, vaccines against this virus this can prevent the infection so once you prevent the infection it doesn't persist hence no cancer the thing is there are a few of these vaccines in the market three if i'm not wrong but these uh, vaccines cost a lot so they cost anywhere between 2500 to 3300 a dose and a teenager would need about uh, two doses of the vaccine and uh, slightly older people would need about three doses of the vaccine you know that's why it isn't feasible it is a very high cost vaccine so it's not feasible for all so the homegrown vaccine would be cheaper 
in an event uh, recently adar punawala from uh, serum institute of india which is the company that has developed the vaccine with support from uh, the department of biotechnology of uh, the government he said that the vaccines would cost anywhere between 200 to 400 rupees so you can imagine the cost is about 1/10 even less than that so that is why we needed the home grown vaccine and now that the vaccine is ready and will be available at a lesser cost Do we know if the government is planning to start an immunization program? So far, of course, uh, with these there were vaccines available in India, but you know there have been a lot of controversies regarding this vaccine. So these vaccines haven't been introduced in the government program as of yet. I mean, cost is of course one factor, but also there were you know these reports. There was a not so well conducted trial years ago, and uh, somebody said you know there were deaths because of it, which turned out it wasn't but by then there was this whole image of the vaccine so you know the government couldn't push forward at that time and we haven't had an hpv vaccination program even though there have been other countries in the world where we have seen that there is a drastic drop in the incidence of cervical cancer when uh, the vaccine is introduced so that's when the government also decided to support indigenous vaccines and sii in a grand challenge by the government actually developed this vaccine although the results are not public yet some of the investigators have said the immunogenicity produced by this vaccine is equivalent to almost the same as whatever is available in the market so basically the indigenous vaccine that has been developed by sii is a quadrivalent vaccine which means it protects against the four most common strains of the hpv virus which are known to persist in human beings and cause uh, these cancers so the vaccine protects against hpv 6 11 16 and 18 these are the most common hpv infections that persist in uh, women and that leads to cancer so now that we have a cheaper vaccine there seems to be a push by the government to have a universal vaccination campaign for teenage girls well anona can you tell us why the government is focusing on teenage girls only for this vaccination program so uh, basically uh, the hpv vaccine how it works is it prevents an hpv infection and hpv is a sexually transmitted uh, virus so if one becomes sexually active and they get the virus then this vaccine is not effective at all so this is why it is suggested that this be given to teenage uh, people you know before they are sexually active and there is some literature which suggests even after people are sexually active they can get this vaccine till about uh, 26 27 years of age and that's because there are various strains of this virus so even if you've been infected with one strain it can prevent the infection with other strains so that is why it's given but it's ideally preferably should be given to people before they are sexually active and when i say people of course girls will develop cervical cancer but if you also manage to if you have the resources and you know have a program to vaccinate even the boys then you cut down transmission as well in some countries it is given to the boys as well but uh, right now considering the resources and everything what indian express has heard from the officials government is planning to launch it in uh, girls between the age of 9 to 14 years but anybody beyond the age of say 26 uh, years or so will not really benefit from the vaccination so it has to be given in a younger age group preferably before they are sexually active so what about the older age group is there any alternative way for them to reduce the chances of getting cervical cancer so hpv is quite prevalent so chances are if you've been sexually active you might have had the infection that is why it is not suggested in women who are older it's given before they are sexually active but women who have not had the opportunity to get the vaccine and uh, who are uh, now in not in that age group can uh, like reduce their risk of the cancers by having a routine checkup so basically at the age of 30 and i think um, doctors suggest like every 5 years or so they should get their pap smear test done to check if there is any cancerous growth so uh, that's how they can prevent screening is the best way And in the end we share an update in the case against the late father Stan Swamy. 
On Tuesday, a United States-based forensic firm claimed that the digital evidence which was used to arrest Jesuit priest Father Stan Swamy in the Bhima Koregao case was planted on his computer's hard drive. The 84-year-old Swamy was accused in the Elgar Parishad Maoist links case. He died in July 2021 while waiting for interim bail on medical grounds. Arsenal Consulting, a Massachusetts-based digital forensics firm, examined an electronic copy of his computer. They concluded that a hacker infiltrated his device and planted evidence. The firm said in its report that this follows previous reports which documented digital evidence planting on the devices of other human rights activists Rona Wilson and Surendra Gadling. The report said, and I quote, over 50 files were created on Swami's hard drive, including incriminating documents that fabricated links between him and the Maoist insurgency. The final incriminating document was planted on his computer on June 5, 2019, a week before the raid on Swami, unquote. Swami was arrested on the basis of these documents, even though experts raised doubts about the authenticity of these documents. The Elgar case relates to alleged inflammatory speeches delivered at the Elgar Parishad Conclave, which was held at Shadiwar Vada in Pune on December 31st, 2017. The police claim that these speeches triggered violence the next day near the Koregao Bhima War Memorial located on the city's outskirts. The Pune police allege that the conclave was backed by Maoists. After Swami's death, a spokesperson for the Ministry of External Affairs had said that his detention followed due process of law. In response to media queries on the demise of Father Swami last year, the MEA spokesperson said that his bail application was rejected by the courts because of the specific nature of charges against him. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was hosted by me, Rahel Philippos, and written and produced by Ucha Sarman with my help. It was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone who you think would like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcasts at the rate indianexpress.com.